A small and lightweight airplane. A topic seemed unworthy of an interesting story. What is there to say? It is not a powerful bomber, nor a fast and streamlined fighter, nor a respectable airliner. However, the way to all those real combat aircraft for any pilot always started with a small flying thing. Ask anyone and they will reverently remember their first obedient, faithful, forgiving all mistakes machine. The seeming simplicity of its creation is deceptive. Throughout more than a hundred years history of aviation, thousands of people tried to resolve this problem. But only some machines became a legend. It all happened on December 17, 1903. Brothers Orwell and Wilbert Wright from America made three flights on an airplane of their own design. The least attempt lasted 12 seconds, while the best, 59 seconds. But figures did not matter. Civilization entered the era of guided air flight. Feeling big success and willing to make more money on their invention, the brothers classified their works. It was all different in Europe. Flights were big time. Cities were full of posters calling to watch the wonder of the century. The first European to fly was Alberto Santos Dumont, a Brazilian living in France. Then there were others and soon France turned into an airplane fashion queen. Brothers Charles and Gabriel Boisin, inspired by the flight of the Wright brothers, also started to make their airplanes and fly them. One of their airplanes was bought by Henri Fermat. A cyclist and a car racer, he improved the airplane and set several speed records on it. Then, together with his brother Maurice, Henri started to make his own aircraft. A big fan and airplane promoter was Louis Blerio. In July 1909, he was the first to fly over the British Channel on an airplane of his own design. The 50-kilometer long flight from the French town Calais to the British Dover lasted 37 minutes. Everything was for the first time. First airplanes, first pilots, first air school. Everyone was eager to learn how to fly. The first Russian to obtain the pilot's diploma was Mikhail Yefimov. Learning to fly from Henri Fermat, he took part in international competition. Then back in Russia, he became an instructor in a military aviation school. At that time, the name of Sergei Utichkin became well known. He came into aviation after mastering extreme types of sport and everywhere he achieved outstanding results. This redhead guy from Odessa built some kind of a Furman airplane and made performances in 70 cities of the world. Among those who saw his flights were future renowned aircraft designers Polikarpov and Suhoi, engine designers Kamov and Mikulin, pilot Nesterov and spacecraft designer Karalov. Everywhere in the world, flights were mostly cautious, accurate ups and downs, turns with no rolling, a pancake type. But not for Russia. Both Yefimov and Utichkin performed over banks, throwing airplanes into diving. Pyotr Nesterov was confident that an airplane had a permanent support in the air, and he did even more. In August 1913, he performed a closed vertical loop on his airplane. An airplane let the Russian character loose. The airplanes were so far only foreign. However, soon the French aviation fashion caused a boom of imitation in Russia. A whole variety of designs from exact copies of successful foreign airplanes 
to absolutely individual layout. Everyone seemed to become aviators, from students to gray hair professor. A wonderful time with almost complete absence of any signs. The path to an optimum layout was full of trials and errors. The one who dared was altogether a designer, a builder, and a tester. One of the first who made its own airplane was a professor from Kiev, Prince Alexander Kudasha. Although the machine copied the French summer, it differed from the latter. The fin and landing gear were reconstructed, but the main novelty was the more progressive pulling propeller instead of the pushing one. It was already a new airplane. On May 23, 1910, Kudashev performed the first flight on his machine. That date could be deemed the birthday of the Russian aviation. Soon events followed in the history of Russia which influenced the aviation destiny. A huge amount of airplanes appeared in the First World War and the Russian aviation industry started to gain momentum. Revolution and the following civil war brought all those achievements almost to zero. Only in the beginning of the 20s there appeared several aviation centers comprising the remnants of the departed wealth. The aviation resurrection plans required creation of a training airplane. That's when P-6BIS, an airplane of such designation, appeared. It was made by Alexander Parakhovchikov who started his designer's activity before the revolution. The peculiarity of those times was that airplanes appeared fast and got no less fast outdated. The need for the new training airplane was urgent. Leaders of the Russian aviation assumed that it would be better to copy a successful foreign airplane. Such airplanes remained plenty in Russia after the civil war and intervention. Thus, the British Avro 504 became the prototype of the first Soviet training U-1 airplane. The works were conducted by a young Soviet designer, Nikolai Polikarpo. The airplane was in production since 1922 and was used throughout the next 10 years. It was not at all simple in operation. The next Polikarpov's airplane, U-2, was absolutely different. The first flights showed that the airplane was a good one. In January 1928, tests were started by Mikhail Gromov. The pilot was delighted. Piloting in those years was very strict. At the slightest provocation, an airplane could spin. Instead, a lot of efforts were needed to make this airplane fall down. The airplane itself corrected minor mistakes of non-experienced pilots. Such features were very unusual and valuable. U-2 was completely suitable for the pilot's training performance. Minimum flights with instructor, and there you are flying all by yourself. The layout of the airplane and its operation was very simple. U-2 immediately obtained universal recognition. Its production started in 1930 and ended up in 1959. The airplane was being produced throughout 30 years. Its M-11 engine was as long-living as the airplane itself. It was produced in enormous quantity and various modifications. Dozens of different types of machines flew into the sky thanks to this engine. U-2 had so many variants that all of them could hardly be recalled. Besides training versions, there were ambulance, liaison, agricultural. The airplane was put on floats and skis. In the war, it was even used as a light night bomber. Those were only the most renowned variants. From 1944, U-2 was renamed into PO-2 after its designer Nikolai Polikarpov. In the 30s, aviation was extremely popular in the USSR. Together with a mass-produced U-2, a whole army of independent designers made airplanes of their own. 
They did not have any production base, nor funds or materials, but they were invincible enthusiasts. One of the best examples was Alexander Yakovlev. He made his first AIR-1 airplane when he was 21 years old. AIR stood for the initials of Alexei Ivanovich Rykov, one of the Soviet state leaders who was chairman of the Aviation Fans Society and supported the young designer. In those years' terminology, AIR-1 was a baby plane, a super lightweight machine. It was tested by Yulian Piankovsky. The baby plane showed good characteristics, but nobody rushed to provide the young designer with a production base. A single result was not enough. Therefore, in 1927, AIR-1 performed a flight demonstrating its capabilities, Moscow, Kharkov, Sebastopol, Moscow. In this flight, the baby plane set a range record. Although it was not registered since the USSR at that time was not member of the International Aviation Federation. In 1928, the Youth Pioneer Organization collected funds for the Yakovlev's new airplane, AIR-2. The funds were enough even to build AIR-3. On August 24, at Hadinsky Field, pioneers passed the airplane to the Soviet air fleet. AIR-3 carried the name of the pioneer Pravda on board. And again, agitation flights, and again, new record. Such was the time. It was surprising how much a small airplane sustained super hardship. Heat, frosts, rains, runways unprepared for takeoff and landing. The rows of enthusiasts included all kinds of people. While Yakovlev was making the best out of traditional layouts, others experimented with unusual layouts. For example, Boris Chiranovsky was making tailless airplanes. His BIC-7 had an unusual parabolic wing, but it flew very well. Anatoly Bindukovich made LK-4 a transformer airplane. The number of its wings and their location could be changed. Each combination gave this airplane new characteristics. That's how the pilot's training was being resolved from simple to complex. However, lightweight aviation of those years is strongly associated with Alexander Yakovlev's airplanes. The two-seat AIR-7 was designed as a fast-speed sports airplane. Everything in it was aimed at only one purpose, to reach high speed. A powerful engine, well-thought aerodynamic monoplane form, refined trimming. This airplane reached a record speed of 325 kilometers per hour. It was the highest result in the USSR. At that time, designers disputed as to which layout was better, monoplane or biplane. AIR-7 achievements turned into a heavy argument in favor of the monoplane layout. Obtaining the production base, Yakovlev became the head of the lightweight aircraft aviation industry division. It was a status allowing to do a lot. Not attempting to out the super popular U-2, the designer pursued the idea that even primary training must be performed on the fast monoplane. It was extremely difficult to change a slow U-2 for a fast and maneuverable E-16 fighter. An intermediate training airplane was required, so Yakovlev started to make several similar one-seat and two-seat machines. Such scale was highly reasonable. It was based on the stage-by-stage -stage training principle. At first, students of the air schools and air clubs underwent training at a two-seat UT-2. Then they were changing for the one-seat UT-1, which was closer to combat machine. 
the Yakovlev's airplanes were not simple to operate. But they had beautiful forms. Airplanes inspired a kind of a magical willingness to fly them. No less important was that they were equipped with the popular and reliable M11 engine. In 1938, the simple in production and operation UT-1 and UT-2 became the main primary trainers in the Air Force School. A lot of those machines were at air clubs as well. A lot of pilots were thankful to the airplanes of Alexander Yakovlev. He was one of not many who achieved impressive results in the lightweight aviation class, obtaining its own design bureau and good perspective. Other designers were not that successful, but some of them did make good airplanes. For example, G-10 of Vladislav Grybovsky. The designer's idea was that the airplane must be as cheap as possible. This would assist development of air clubs and help preparing a lot of new pilots. The airplane could be cheaper if it was equipped with a low-power engine. But such engines was not put into production, neither was G-10 itself. Numerous attempts were made to put automobile engines on an airplane. One of Grybovsky's projects, the G-23 sports monoplane, was made at a special department of the Gorky automobile plant. However, due to big specific weight, automobile engines had no perspective in aviation. Among airplane designer enthusiasts, it is worth mentioning Alexander Moskalov. Within 10 years, he created 20 relatively successful layouts. His five-seat Sam 5B passenger airplane showed its quality, although the decision was to produce its ambulance version with a large side door. In the first half of the 30s, the lightweight aviation development growth was massive. There were all kinds of competitions among low-power airplanes, the so-called air bugs, selecting the most secure lightweight airplane or those that could land anywhere. All this amateur performance was wrapped up in 1936. The state left the lightweight aviation with only several most successful design bureau. Despite simplicity and low price, not many lightweight airplanes were produced since they were mainly designated for civil needs while the country was fostering military topic priority. Factories were facing enormous tasks of making real combat aircraft. If such tasks were hardly carried out in time, what could be said of the trifle plane? Thus the Kai-1 trainer made at the Kazan Aviation Institute was not put in production. This twin-engine machine was supposed to help pilots to transit the bomber. The project had no continuation, while test pilots insisted on making that airplane. Right before the war, there was a change of fighter generations in the USSR. Monoplanes with retractable landing gear and closed cockpit ousted biplane. Speed grew, maneuverability and combat tactics changed. All this required a relevant training machine. But with the start of the combat actions, that topic was off the point. And although the pilot training tasks became even more acute, they were carried out on the same old Yakovlev's and Polykarpov's training airplane. Development of two seat training modifications of the combat airplanes was the maximum what was done. Due to disastrous situation in the beginning of the war, a number of training airplanes was used in combat action. UT-1 and UT-2 were armed, but most of all the legendary U-2 was used. They performed liaison, ambulance and partisan unit support missions. Dozens of night bombers units were equipped with U-2. The bombs they took on board were not serious, but their constant night visits disturbed and exhausted the enemy. The Germans gave U-2 many names. 
One was the sewing machine, murmuring at night, preventing the enemy from sleep. Before the war, one and the same low-power airplanes could be meant for training, sport, and general purposes. After the war, all such machines required division into separate classes. For training airplanes, it was always important to have such qualities as stability and controllability, correcting even rough mistakes at piloting. The need of them after the war even increased. Relations between the countries which defeated fascism began to worsen. Arms race went on another loop. At that time, Yak-11 combat trainer was used to prepare military pilots. It was based on one of the best wartime piston engine fighters, Yak-3. No doubt that Yak-11 was perfect. After mastering Yak-11, transition to a fighter was easy. However, Yak-11 was not an airplane for primary training, which was in great need. Having refurbished the pre-war UT-2, Alexander Yakovlev started to make the new UT-2L, although it could hardly be called new. The landing gear was fixed and the layout had mostly wooden parts. In the beginning of the war, USSR suffered shortages in aluminum, but for 1945 a wooden airplane was of course anachronism. UT-2L was not produced. Thereafter, there appeared an all-metal Yak-18. It had all the qualities of an airplane of such designation, simple in operation, solid and reliable. It had signs of the new times as well, closed cockpit, retractable landing gear and a radio station. In the course of its service, Yakovlev kept on updating the airplane. The most successful modification Yak-18A resulted from installation of a new M14 engine. The 1.5 times increase in power gave the airplane absolutely new flight quality. All new machines by that time were equipped with a nose wheel. This made the airplane ground driving simpler. Yak-18A had such a wheel. Yak-18 production of different modifications amounted to 7,000. Throughout dozens of years, this airplane was used in the military and civil aviation schools and sports air clubs. Yak-18 obtained its substitution only in 1974 when Yakovlev's design bureau made a new training machine, Yak-52. This machine was of course a product of its time and radically differed from its predecessors. Although increased capabilities resulted in the high price. The two-seat Yak-52 was rather expensive for primary training. But at that time money was not much counted. Basically, Yakovlev always followed the rule of making two variants on a unified basis, a one-seat and a two-seat airplane. Anything could change in the pilot's training except the main principle, from simple to complex. First with instructor on a two-seat machine and then on a one-seat to improve the skills. Besides, the one-seat version was best of all for aerobatics. It was preferable for the machines of this category to have minimum maneuver margin. Which means that control becomes very sensitive and machine responds to a minimum stick movement. Good maneuverability is no less important. Machines with such qualities were made only for those who had reached a certain piloting level. Such airplane was designated for aggressive aerobatics. Therefore, it was important for the layout to sustain huge G-low. 
The beauty of aerobatics, not least of all, depends on the harmonic outlines of the airplane. A special aerobatic airplane appeared in 1959. It was made on the basis of Yak-18 and was defined as Yak-18P. Its systems were worked out in such a way that even in an upside-down flight the fuel and oil supply of the engine was uninterruptible. Despite its minor dimensions, the machine was tested seriously. Yak-18P was tested by the well-known test pilot Sergei Anofen. Such attention to aerobatic machines was not accidental. Aerobatic World Championships started to take place from 1960 and Soviet pilots took active part in them. After the Stalin's death, the country felt more free and produced a number of records. It was important to be the first everywhere, including sport. The first performance in 1960 was not outstanding, but on the next championship, the Soviet team was second. Two years later, it won the Nesterov Cup. The pilot's skills were developing, so were the machine's capability. Following Yak-18P, there came Yak-18PM, with a more powerful engine and a wider range of admissible G-loads. For better observation, the cockpit was moved backward. Already in 1966, all the leading places were occupied by the Soviet pilots. Vladimir Martimyanov and Galina Korchuganova became champions. In 1968, competitors progressed and Germans became champions. They performed on an aerobatic airplane of the Czech Zlin company. Its history started way back in the 30s and it was steeped in airplane building traditions. The Zlin company built a number of minor airplanes which were used for training and successfully participated in competition. The best of its airplanes was Zlin 50 which was made exclusively for aerobatics. Another claimant of the aerobatic crown was the American Pitts Special biplane. It had minor dimensions, small weight and respectable power reserve. Pitts Special could roll in the air like a thrown matchbox. The bad thing was that the referees were unable to see what was this small airplane doing up in the sky. So the Yakovlev machine had all chances for success. In 1970 there appeared Yak-18PS, a lightweight machine as compared with the predecessor. Two years later there came Yak-50 aerobatic airplane, the top of the Yak-18 family. Since that time practically all wins at the World and European Championships belong to Soviet pilots. Aerobatics requires readiness, endurance, and self-control from the pilot. But that is not all. Spectators may think that the airplane is flying in a boundless space, but the size of the air stage is strictly limited. In order to perform all program elements within the narrow limits, the pilot needs perfect coordination, instant reaction and a bit of sports luck. That's how it was before, that's how it is now. Conditions of the pilot's performance have not changed, while the airplanes made a huge step forward. A one-seat aerobatic Yak-55 airplane first took off in 1982. Everything in the new airplane was made to reach maximum maneuverability. A symmetrical profile wing was applied. 
In other words, there was no difference in piloting whether the airplane was flying in a normal or an upside-down position. Performance mostly depended on the pilot. While previous aerobatic Yaks grew from training airplanes, Yak-55 was a sports airplane of a new generation. Not long before that, the Yakovlev's monopoly in sports airplanes production was slightly disturbed by the Students' Design Bureau of the Moscow Aviation Institute. The students made Quant airplane took off in 1977. Its size and form were ideal for the aerobatic geometry and all it did in the sky looked very harmonically from the ground. The Quant's proportions later became classical and made the basis for many sports airplanes built later. In 1992, the same institute made another aerobatic machine, Aviatica 900. The student's layout was peculiar for a lot of new non-standard engineering and technological solutions. Attempts of the student's design bureau were not considered as anything serious. The Yakovlev's monopoly ended up only when the sports topic was undertaken by the Suhoi Design Bureau, which used to make only military aircraft. The history of the Su-26 sports aerobatic airplane was not simple. Designer Vyacheslav Kondratyev first elaborated on the Su-26 layout when he worked in the Yakovlev's Design Bureau. He then had to leave and works continued in the Sukhoi team. Thus in 1984 an aerobatic airplane appeared under the brand of Su-26 which gave birth to the world-renowned family. Conditions for the airplane's creation and improvement were principally new. Designers were diligently inquiring the sports pilots how the airplane should be done in order to have advantage over other machines at the competition. In other words, the tool for the achievements was made upon a special order of the sport pilot. This virtually resulted in the Su-26 enormous success. Any trifle was taken into account, for example how the step at the cockpit entrance is made or how the controls are located on the panel. That's what the sport of high achievement means, even unimportant details become significant. Since 1986, practically all medals and prizes at the championships were won by the Soviet and later by the Russian pilot. The Su-26 potential was so big that the foreign aircraft of the same class appearing later were inferior. The airplane was being constantly modified. The next family member was a two-seat Su-29. Its first takeoff was in 1991. Since aerobatics related to extreme types of sport, designers thought of equipping airplanes with a pilot rescue system. A standard ejection seat due to the airplane's minor dimensions did not fit. Thus, an interesting escape system was invented. An extending bar was picking up the pilot out of the cockpit. Another family member was Su-31, a one-seat variant of Su-29. The new identification resulted from a lot of novelties added to the basic layout. Practically all systems were improved. The Su-26 family members demonstrate their outstanding characteristics around the world. Nobody can stay indifferent watching what they can do.
airplanes of the Suhoi Design Bureau firmly put pressure on their competitors in the sphere of sports aviation. However, Yakovlev's designers did not sit on their hands. In 1993, following long-lasting traditions, the Yakovlev's team made a two-seat aerobatic airplane Yak-54. By the time of its appearance, Russia entered the world society. Wider export possibilities were open. That's when the Yak-54 low price became significant. The airplane obtained good export perspective. At all times, there was a lot of work for the light aviation. This diversity was hard to describe, so such airplanes were attributed to the general purpose aviation. This category had lower takeoff and landing requirements in order to expand its application. Economic efficiency was also important. The main supplier of such machines was Alexander Yakovlev's Design Bureau. As far back as in 1944, an old wooden four-seat Yak-13 was made there. A bit later, Yak-10 was built, which was more successful and therefore put in production. Finally, there appeared Yak-12, one of the most wonderful Yakovlev's machines of its class. Here is an episode of the life of this aircraft. In 1950, Stalin made an offer to make a small airplane capable of taking off with a very short run. The leader was inspired by the fact that Adolf Hitler had a Storch airplane ready to evacuate him at the very last moment of the war by taking off vertically from a tiny pad. Stalin ordered to have an airplane with exactly the same takeoff characteristics. Yakovlev fulfilled the task by putting a more powerful engine on Yak-12. It was very simple in operation. In one of the Soviet films made in the 50s, an airplane was piloted by a youngster. This fact was not at all the main fact featured in the film. It performed all kinds of works and it was really a general-purpose airplane. However, light aviation in the USSR was not as popular as in the West. The principal difference was that in the West anyone could easily have a small airplane as its private property. Therefore, aviation of this class had deep traditions and many years of progress. Dozens of companies offered airplanes on sale. The buyers were using them like passenger cars, for example, to go out fishing. In mid-60s, Yakovlev proposed a minor four-seat Yak-18T. It was initially made for Air Flot students' training. The comfort was in that the student and instructor were sitting side by side like in an airliner. This particular airplane with the automobile type cabin was best suitable for private utilization. Unfortunately, at that time it was impossible to buy a private airplane in the USSR. For some time there was a prohibition not only on purchase but on production as well. Only at the beginning of the 80s there came some liberalization causing a boom that could be compared with a craze for aviation of the 30s. Everyone started to make airplanes, often with no professional knowledge, while professional test pilots had to test those amateur products. This amateur wave continued in the 90s, when together with the amateurs, large companies got interested in the general-purpose airplanes. State funding of the major aircraft construction practically stopped, and companies made a stake on minor machines which could be quickly built and sold. Commercial euphoria reached an enormous scale. 
the comfortable 4-seat Yak 18T found its market. Many new layouts appeared. Several machines were made by the Krunichi factory, which traditionally dealt with only space equipment. The most renowned airplanes became Il-103 and Gzhel. Il-103 was made in the Illusion Design Bureau, which is concentrated on large airliners. However, a minor four-seat Il-103 was a success. The Gzhel Mini Airliner was also born at a well-known design bureau. It was made at the Messischief Experimental Machine Building Factory. During the Cold War, it was developing heavy strategic bombers. While in the 80s, the factory actively participated in the Energy Buran Airspace Program. After all those huge projects, the proposal was minor, but the airplane was important. Gzhel had a pressurized cabin for high-altitude flights, a powerful and cost-efficient turboprop engine, and the relevant modern avionics. In hope of finding demand, minor airplanes are offered in various versions, including those for private use. However, this sector in Russia develops slowly. The air traffic code is not yet adapted to light aviation. Nowadays, due to terrorist threats, there have been so many flight limitations that it has become unprofitable to have a private airplane. We shall complete our story of the light aviation with a description of the jet aircraft of this class. The jet era started in the end of the 40s. The big aviation in mass and speed went far ahead, while the minor aviation, as a step to it, could not keep up. This predetermined appearance of the training jet airplanes. At the initial stage of mastering jet airplanes, there came dual control aircraft, two-seat versions of combat machine. But this was rather costly for mass training. Therefore, in the 50s, design bureaus were assigned to make a training jet aircraft. Alexander Yakovlev offered very good airplanes, a two-seat Yak-30 and a one-seat Yak-32. They were best for their designation. Simple, solid, easy in control and service. A Yakovlev aerobatic airplane is in the air. It covered a closed loop of 100 kilometers at a speed of 750 kilometers per hour. The new world record for the lightweight jet engine airplanes was set by Rosalia Shikina, the aerobatic champion of Russia. But the country's leadership, driven by political matters, preferred the Czech L-29 Dolphin, although it was inferior to Yakovlev's machine. That airplane became the first in Russia training jet aircraft. The Soviet Union obtained around 3,000 machines, most of those produced. Dolphin was highly reliable and comfortable in control. Future pilots could perform their first flights on the L-29 jet without trying piston engine machines. Thereafter, the Czechs were offered to build the next generation, the L-39 Albatross. Accent in its development was made on economical effectiveness, one of the main factors for the primary training machine. Adequate operational costs were obtained thanks to the bypass engine with low consumption. 
Most of all pilots like the comfortable cockpit with excellent observation. Pilots training on L-39 started over 30 years ago. It is still in service. Throughout such a long life, in the Soviet aviation this airplane became almost a symbol of a training machine. The Airbatic Group Rus, based on L-39 airplanes, was founded in the end of the 80s. Elegant machines are in pure harmony with the beauty of their performance. Even with a relatively minor thrust-to-weight ratio of a training machine, pilots make aggressive performances. L-39 flying at a head-on course looks spectacular. The audience is equally fascinated by the Albatross single and group flight. In the modern times, the contest was announced for a training aircraft with a new ideology when special systems produce an impression as if a pilot flies a light MiG-29 or a heavy Su-27. The Mikoyan Corporation offered a training MiG-AT, while Yakovlev made Yak-130. A pilot can be trained not only in the piloting technique, but in the combat application. However, aircraft's capabilities are not limited by training functions. If needed, they can be utilized as fighters or attack aircraft. Their armament is quite strong. Controls are the same as with the big machines. These aircraft are not like the old ones. It is already a different conceptual level. 100 years in history is just an instant. But how drastically the aircraft has changed from the first disobeying air stacks to super intellectual combat systems. It is not the aircraft size that matter. A huge bomber performs defense tasks. A fighter struggles for the air superiority. An airliner connects continents. But the way to the sky starts with a small airplane. Everyone has its own work. <laughs> 